another thing is this man right here who talks the talk and walks the walk when it comes to values and integrity. <laughs> so, Mark. Um, I'm going to start with a little uh, sort of discussion of the past, present, and future of the values in medicine, science, and technology conference, just sort of like where we've been um, and where we might be going. And then I will lull you to sleep with a bit of a history lecture um, uh, before uh, rousing you to uh, wakefulness with some outrageous claims about the current <laughs> and future states of the field. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the conference and how it came to be and sort of some of the things that have changed over time, just because this is our 10th one. It's nice to, I think, reflect a little bit about, about the nature of the conference. So I'm going to make it a little overly autobiographical. So apologies, right? In spring, 20, in spring 2009, um, uh, I was hired here uh, to teach philosophy of technology. So I, I you know, I came and interviewed in March or whatever it was, February. I was hired to teach philosophy of technology, the big arts and technology program, and uh, that's what they wanted me to teach. Um, but uh, early summer of 2009, the state of Texas funded the Center for Values in Medicine, Science and Technology at UT Dallas. Um, they used a big bunch of the uh, Recovery Act funds that were available for education to do this. Um, and so uh, as a result, um, while I was sort of preparing uh, to move to, to Dallas, I got an email from our dean that said, I want you to tell me what a Center for Values in Medicine, Science, and Technology should do. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, a few days later, I wrote a long email, <laughs> only the first three paragraphs. Everybody else wrote like a two line, yeah, like happy, happy to talk to you about it, whatever. I wrote like a 20 page email or something about all the things I think it should do, just totally. Uh, you know, naive and excited, right? Um, and uh, so I, I arrived here. I was part of uh, the planning committee for our first annual lecture series that took place in 2009, um, 2010. Um, I met Magda when I arrived um, and uh, started working with her. And in 2011, I became the director of the Center for Values. Um, and uh, one of the things that I really wanted to do was start doing conferences connected with our, our lecture theory theme. Originally, every conference was like very closely tied to a theme. Um, that is kind of well, it's one of the things that's changed over time. Um, some other things that have changed over time. In 2015, we did our first pre-conference workshop before the conference, which we've done not every year, but most of the years since. Um, uh, then, um, in 2016, we had a joint meeting with the Consortium for Socially Relevant Philosophy of Slash in Science and Engineering, the CERP boys, the, the society with the easiest name to uh, say in the world. In 2017, we had a joint meeting with the Comics and Popular Arts Conference, um, including a, a lovely guest lecture from, or a, a keynote lecture from Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, and 2020 was going to be our 10th annual conference, um, big celebration, um, and it was canceled due to COVID. And we did some online stuff for a couple of years. And so this is take two at our 10th annual conference. Um, and, uh, and by the way, I just want to point out, I, I didn't uh, advertise this very hard, but um, Yuna Lee, who many of you have been here before know, put together a nice website in celebration of our 10th anniversary um, that has uh, some of the links are broken, I just discovered, but um, uh, there's links to our old programs and uh, uh, publications and collaborations that were generated, you know, based on things that people did um, in the conference. So that's where we've been and where we're at. Um, that's a, that's a, little, a little bit of organizational biography, I guess, um, interlude before we get back to the main function of the talk, main focus of the talk, which is to talk about the field of values in science its past, present, and future. Um, this is going to be a very philosophy of science sort of focused talk, um, uh, which, uh, you know, for which my apologies um, for those who not fit neatly into that area. Um, but uh, it's it sort of defines a lot of the way that I think about these things. And so that's what I'm going to focus on. But 
trouble it a little bit at the end. Um, so the past, I want to talk about uh, just briefly four traditions in the, the history of discussions of values in science and philosophy. Um, I'm going to demarcate this history uh, um, uh, from 1877, uh, the publication of The Fixation of Belief by Charles Saunders Peirce, and on the other end, in 2000, by the publication of Inductive Risk and Values in Science by Heather Douglas, um, because everything that's since 2000 is obviously the present and not the past, right? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so the four traditions are, are philosophical pragmatism, um, uh, the Marxist tradition in philosophy of science, feminist tradition in philosophy of science, and then uh, another tradition who I, that I don't have a great name for, um, so I would be happy to have a better name for it, but which I'm describing as the sort of environmental slash policy slash risk assessment tradition in thinking about values in science. Um, and so let me let me tell you a little bit about um, what I think is going on in each of these four traditions. Um, and then try to do a little bit of comparison of the different sort of fo focuses and um, uh, and emphases in those traditions that I think sometimes um, lead people who are grounded in one or the other of the traditions um, to, to sometimes be sort of um, aiming at different targets, say. Um, although I think that's 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 increasingly not that's decreasing as a problem. Um, so the pragmatist approach in values and science, as I said, I sort of start with uh, Charles Peirce on this. Um, uh, so, you know, Peirce, uh, this famous quote from Peirce, consider what effects which might conceivably have practical bearings. We conceive the object of our conception to have, then our conception of these effects is the whole of our conception of the object, right? Um, Peirce is tying our understanding of the meaning of beliefs or, or concepts to um, action, right, um, to, to practical consequences. Um, Peirce himself is, is uh, no notoriously kind of ambivalent about um, uh, making the inference from this to any kind of values in science idea, um, uh, but clearly the move to say, well, some, some kind of practical reasoning and not just pure theoretical reasoning, therefore, has to play a, a role in our epistemological universe um, uh, and that, you know, that brings up the specter of values. Um, uh, Peirce was not, you know, he was not totally convinced of that, but William James was, right? Um, uh, in The Will to Believe, right, William James articulates this idea that um, believe truth or sh and shun error, these are two separate logical laws that must be balanced against one another um, in our decision about whether or not to believe things, right? Um, and notoriously, he tells us that um, passional considerations, right? one way of thinking about values, I think, um, uh, in some cases play a role in determining how we do that, right? Um, and as he developed his, his pragmatic philosophy, he increasingly insisted on this notion that a certain kind of um, practical reasoning played a key role in our assessment of um, uh, of beliefs, right? Um, uh, so that's that's James, but um, the person who sort of makes clearest, I think, his commitments to values in science is John Dewey. Um, we've talked a lot about Dewey in a lot of different contexts, um, and so I'm going to talk about him some more here. Uh, uh, um, but, um, you know, Dewey's kind of key notion is that inquiry is the resolution of a problematic situation in order to return to a kind of stable practice or to enable a kind of intelligent action, right? So we find ourselves in problematic situations when we don't know what to do, we don't know how to act, we don't know what to think, we don't know how to respond. Um, and inquiry is the sort of reason, is the, the attempt to resolve that problem. Um, in order to act, um, and that is is you know in in a variety of ways sort of governed by our assessment of what uh, what a you know what a good way to act is right. Uh, it's going to be influenced by value judgments. Um, Dewey is also um, 
And in fact, he's much more interested in the argument that value judgment itself is a form of empirical inquiry. He is interested in bringing sort of the understanding of the, the method of resolving problems that he thinks is becomes highly developed in science to ethics, right? Um, uh, he also thinks that democracy is a form of collaborative inquiry. Um, in works like The Public and Its Problems, he articulates an account of participatory democracy um, as inquiry, as collective collaborative inquiry um, into matters of public interest. Um, and he has an account of the aims of social science, that social science is for solving social problems, is for um, doing social planning, is for crafting public policy, right? Um, and uh, although he rejects um, certain kinds of ideas about an ultimate methodological distinction between the social sciences and the natural sciences um, that you might that you see in some of his contemporaries. Um, he he insists that the, in terms of the sort of aims of the of research, um, often taking the natural sciences as a model for the social sciences has been a huge mistake. Um, so. Um, Later pragmatists, broadly speaking, um, that had a particularly, you know, at least in retrospect, an important, an important influence on the philosophy of science. Um, C. West Churchman, um, uh, in some ways much more of a Persian through his, uh, through his mentor, Edgar Singer. Um, Churchman said, you know, no fact or law of science can be determined without presupposing ethical principles. And Churchman, you know, after his long tenure as editor of philosophy of science, um, sort of absconded from philosophy into management science, into operations research, uh, which he conceived as a kind of, of scientized way of thinking about ethics and action, right? Um, uh, we could say more about that, but, uh, and then, um, Sort of kind of final important thinker, I think, in the pragmatist in this in this sort of pragmatist moment would be Richard Rudner, who, um, you know, uh, sort of a mentee of Churchman, um, among others, and uh, sort of harkening back to this idea that finding William James, right? This this he makes a kind of inductive risk argument in order to argue that the scientists, qua scientists, must make value judgments and insists in his famous paper at the end that in order to guarantee the objectivity of science, we require a science of ethics. Right? Now, there's a lot of key voices I left out here from the pragmatist tradition who have important things to say um, about values and the relationship of values in science. Uh, we could talk about Jane Addams, Len Locke, Abraham Edel, Abraham Kaplan, Morton White. Um, but uh, uh, I think they were sort of less, some of them were less centrally focused on philosophy of science. And so I kind of left them. Um, the second tradition in values in science that I want to talk about is a, is a Marxist tradition or Marxist approach. This is something that um, I'm learning more about at the moment. It's something I'm, I'm sort of exploring a little bit. Um, I want to talk about one, I think one of the most important, um, certainly one of the most influential Marxist philosophers in science, which is Otto Neurath. Right. Um, uh, uh, and Don Howard has talked a lot about Neurath in this connection, um, but, but Neur among other things, Neurath uh, made an, a, an early version of the gap argument or underdetermination under argument for values in science. Um, he insisted, contrary to many of his um, colleagues in the Vienna Circle, that pragmatic and political considerations needed to guide scientific investigations and logical or philosophical investigations. Um, his insistence on a physicalist language was primarily, he primarily conceived of it as a kind of antidote to certain obstacles to social and political progress that came out of confused, uh, idealistic uh, ways of talking about things. Um, and he he's regularly promoted the use of science for socialist ends, right? Uh, ends of economic planning, social planning, uh, and, and similar. Um, there's actually a much broader and more complicated Marxist tradition instead of Marxist discussions in philosophy of science. The Don Howard has talked about the the, the you know volume of publications on explicitly Marxist questions in the early 
um, in the early years of the Journal of Philosophy of Science, but not that early, if we since 1956. Um, as you may know, the founding editor of, uh, of Philosophy of Science was uh, not just a Marxist, but a Soviet spy, right? William Melisov was a Soviet spy. George Reich has talked about that in his book. Um, and so um, I think there's more to be, I, I would like to spend more time investigating this tradition, but I think it has some interesting, um, some interesting features. Um, I'll, I'll mostly talk about my rod. Um, or have mostly talked about them. Okay, um, I hesitate to try to quickly summarize the next couple of things, which many of you are very familiar with already. And so I'm going to say, I'm going to make some, uh, uh, as Dan said, gross generalizations, right? So feminist approaches to values in science. Um, I had a list of about of about like 30 names, but I tried to pare it down to a few key ones who made influential moves, right? Um, um, so Helen Longino, Phyllis Rooney, Don Haraway, Sandra Harding, but you know, I could name, I could, anyway, there's only so many hours I could spend on that list. Um, feminist philosophers of science began thinking about these issues from cases where widespread, um, comprehensive, deleterious values or value systems lead to bad results in science, um, and often lead to bad ill-founded consensus in science, right? So um, uh, patriarchy, of course, being the most um, the most common one that they ex examine. Um, arguments from underdetermination or the gap argument is often central to classic feminist approaches to values in science, often plays a crucial um, a role in these in their in their arguments. Um, and uh, the feminist tradition tends to focus on social level alternatives to um, patriarchal science, social level ways of thinking about um, how to manage values in science. And, and there's, a, there's a number of different ones. There's, there's sort of constructing an account of what an appropriately diverse critical community would look like, as in the work of Longinow. There's various versions of standpoint theory that have played uh, an important role, including Sandra Harding's version. Um, various accounts of social justice as an aim. Uh, for uh, for science um, and as a way of thinking about the appropriate role of values in science um, and and many others, but but um, a lot of the feminist approaches focus on individual level norms or or structures or accounts. And then the environmental slash policy slash risk management tradition or approach to values in science. Again, this is a this is a list that could be really long. Um, in order to make it shorter, I, I put our end date at 2000 in a way. Um, but some of the, you know, some of the important figures in this field would be uh, William Lawrence, um, Kristen Schrader for Shet, Brian Norton, Sheldon Krimsky, Carl Craner. Um, I think Heather Douglas uh, comes out of this tradition primarily. Um, and I think Kevin Elliott uh, in his earliest works comes primarily out of this tradition, um, is thinking primarily with this tradition. Um, this tradition is influenced by controversies in environmental science, both within environmental science and kind of public and political controversies related to environmental science, the role of science in policy um, and approaches to risk management science and how to think about values there. Um, you know, one of the, I think, central um, sort of late achievements of this tradition is Heather Douglas's revival and significant improvement of the inductive risk arguments that figured in the pragmatist tradition um, and has continued to be influential um, by people drawing mainly in this, working mainly in this tradition. Um, and uh, within this tradition, I think there's a tendency to focus on norms for individual researchers or individual studies or individual laboratory groups or whatever, right? So, but more of an individual level norms. Um, uh, so um, to kind of, to kind of sum up, uh, I've, I've identified like a few areas of comparison, a few key ideas um, uh, on, on which we can kind of compare these um, these uh, traditions. Right, one is um, you know the the argument that values plays an important role within science. Right, um, and here I might mean by values what is sometimes referred to as non-epistemic values. 
Um, another is the idea that science has an important role to play in uh, thinking about values, right? Whether that's um, something strong, like Rudner's claim that we need a science of ethics, um, or something weaker, like Dewey's claim that um, uh, ethics is a kind of empirical inquiry that can learn a lot from science. Um, whether there's an, an interest or emphasis on the role of science in policy, um, in thinking about uh, values in science, um, or alternatively, thinking about the role of science and in activism and, and sort of activist movements, whether that plays an important role, um, whether democratic values are an important uh, concept, right? Whether we want to think about value judgments that are influenced or somehow democratically consultative. Um, and then this question about individual versus social focus um, that I talked about. So um, this is a work in progress. So if you think I'm wrong about any of the, the boxes on this chart, um, I'm eager to hear your corrections. So I think, you know, if we think about the pragmatists, they were definitely interested in the influence of values on science. They were probably, many of them were more interested in the influence of science on values in some way or other. Definitely a lot of interest in science for policy. Not so much of an emphasis on science and activism per se. Um, uh, I mean, I think if, maybe if we brought Jane Adams into the discussion, that would trouble that uh, the red X there a little bit, but um, they're mainly thinking about Le you know, more and less official or formal um, uh, sort of policy uh, roles for science. Um, definitely an interest and emphasis on democratic values. Um, definitely a lot of uh, individual focus, focused um, recommendations or ideas about the role of values in science. Um, and, uh, you know, although there are a lot of commitments in the pragmatist tradition that might lead you to think that they should also have a lot of sort of social norms, social focus. There's actually relatively little. So you look at Peirce or James uh, or Dewey and their sort of discussions of like, you know, how the normative discussions of inquiry, they tend to be focused on like the individual inquirer, right? And Dewey's commitments on, I mean, Dewey's sort of larger political commitments. Um, he talks about sort of the role of science, the role of experts, but doesn't doesn't really talk about the scientific community so much. Um, I think maybe Churchman is an exception here. Um, I think Churchman has a lot to say about the organization of the scientific community. Um, uh, I'm not sure I like what he has to say, but he has still things to say. So um, the Marxist tradition similarly sees science and values in a kind of mutual dialectic relationship, right? That plays out in different ways for different philosophers of science. Um, you know, with someone like Abu Neurath, who sort of has some, um, you know, positive positivist worries about values as a as a thing, right? About the cognitive status of values. Um, it's less of an interest, but definitely there are a lot of more orthodox Marxists who who want to think about. The, this is a mutually influencing system. A lot of emphasis on science for policy, so social planning, the role of science in social planning is important in that early 20th century Marxist tradition. Um, I This is maybe just something I haven't found. I, I don't see a lot of philosoph Marxist philosophers of science talking about sort of activism and social movements and the way that science can influence that. Um, I mean, there's, there's, you know, um, there's some rhetoric amongst the Vienna Circle about about logical positivism as a social movement, but um, and you know obviously there are Marxist activists, there are Marxist social movements, but the thinking about science doesn't maybe go along with that in the stuff that I've read. Um, similarly, I think there's a kind of ambivalence about democratic values, right? I mean, you know, obviously Marx's ultimate sort of um, political views are strongly democratic. But um, the sort of account of ideology and ideology critique in the Marxist tradition troubles a sort of simple way of thinking about democratic values. Um, uh, and I think the focus is primarily on sort of social, social structures here, um, the social role of science and sort of social norms for science. Um, this is the, the next one is the one I, I kind of had the most trouble uh, assigning 
values. Maybe it's just because the tradition is too diverse um, or maybe just because I know too much about it. Um, and so I get too nuanced. But, um, you know, within the feminist tradition, you know, obviously there's a lot of interest in the role of values in science. Um, that's going to be that's going to be on all four, obviously. Um, uh, there there are some feminist philosophers of science who are interested in um, if not the exactly the role of science in values, you know, thinking about the mutual influence of science and values. So um, people like Lynn Hankins and Nelson, for example, thinking about values in this kind of Quinean web of valif kind of form are thinking about these things as interacting. Um, there's less of an interest in sort of specific policy um, uh, science, science for policy stuff in the feminist tradition. If we if we bracket it um, to, to 2000 and before, I think, um, and a lot of interest in sort of science and activism, the role of science in um, in various kinds of anti-sexist, anti-racist um, social movements. Um, I think a similar ambivalence about democratic values, right? Um, because of course, right, we know um, in the period, especially in the historical periods that they're analyzing and criticizing, uh, there's a, a very popular, patriarchal values are very popular. So there's some, you know, it's gotta be some nuance or some worrying about that. And as I said before, I think there's a significant social focus. And then in the environmental slash policy slash risk management approach, um, I think uh, there has been very little, there was very little consideration of the role of science in values. Um, uh, there's definitely an emphasis on science for policy. Um, I think there's some, there's, there's, a, there's some interest in sort of larger sort of activism and social movements, but, but uh, not as much um, as in the feminist the tradition, definitely a strong focus on democratic values. And although there are definitely some exceptions to this generalization, um, an emphasis on sort of individual level norms um, for values in science that um, has been you know, very influential uh, down to the present. Um, so that's, that's, my, that's my history. So now it's time to wake up because um, I'm going to talk about the present um, and talk about a, a few recent developments in the values and science literature within, uh, within philosophy of science that I think are important. So I'm going to kind of give an opinionated account of them. Um, I'm interested to hear what you think. Um, but uh, one of them is I think it is I think it is extremely clear today that the value free ideal is a generating research program, right? It's not dead, it's not over, but there, like none of the publications on it are any good, right? <laughs> it, you know, everything that is published about the value free ideal for the most part ignores most of the important moves that have been made in the field, right? Um, I, some of the stuff I'm not quite sure how it makes it through peer review, but it's not engaging with the, the the key arguments and moves in the literature, and it's also not producing any new work, right? That is mainly arguing with people who argue against the value free ideal. There's very little new developments. On the other hand, right, work on values in science and value laden science is accumulating numerous case new case studies numerous new accounts of how things work, trying to sort of do a lot of fine-grained, uh, detailed thing, clearly a progressive research program um, in the Lakatoshian sense, right? Um, so, so it's, you know, degenerating pro research programs, you know, they can last a long time and they can even come back from that situation, but that's the state of things. Um, another recent development is what, uh, and uh, uh, Helen introduced us to this term, but it's a, it's a thing that has been um, making the rounds in the literature over the last year or so, um, uh, is the new demarcation problem. This is a new name for an old problem, right? Which is, um, how do we understand the, how do we sort of um, look at the bad and good or illegitimate and legitimate roles or types of values in science, right? So. I mean, um, we can see 
you know, any, anyone who's trying to displace the value-free ideal is, is already worrying about this problem to some extent, right? Um, and this is, a, this is a new way of framing it. I actually don't like this way of framing it because I think, you know, the old demarcation problem was not a productive thing to look at, right? And so framing it in this way is almost kind of self-defeating. But anyway, it's an important issue um, with a new bad name. Um, but it's, it's, you know, I, I would say like a lot of the literature in the last 10 years that's not sort of applications to new cases focused, that's more theoretically focused is, is doing some version of that, right? Another new development um, uh, that um, has been pushed by a few different people, but probably Drew Schroeder is the most, um, might be the most well-known person for pushing this, is a kind of political turn, right? So to trying to shift the focus, and, and it's, it's not, you know, it's not like we're turning to something we weren't talking about, but try to shift the focus from more sort of ethics focused discussions of values in science to more politically discuss focused discussions of values in science. The political focus was always there, but um, I think what's interesting about the new political turn is a uh, increased engagement with mainstream political philosophy and um, uh, uh, attention to questions like trust in science, political legitimacy, um, and I think more nuanced uh, focus on how exactly we might democratize value judgments or or, or, or bring in some kind of democ democracy to the context. Right? Um, and then another uh, another recent development, which um, Dan uh, contributed to in their talk uh, earlier uh, in the earlier session, is empirical approaches, uh, you know, various kinds of empirical approaches um, involving. Um, you know, psychologists or experimental philosophers or science communication scholars um, trying to get at both um, the sort of views and attitudes that scientists have about these questions, um, also trying to understand the um, public views about some of the relevant questions. Um, and I think that's a really important uh, recent development. Um, uh, you know, obviously, um, the empirical approaches don't settle the kind of key normative questions that we philosophers of science tend to be most interested in in the values and science discussion, but they do help correct, um, as I think Dan pointed out, a number of, of misconceptions or at least um, uh, totally empirically ungrounded generalizations that we tend to make about some of these things, about what scientists believe or what the public believes. And so, on. so these are obviously not all of the interesting things that are going on in the field at present, but these are, I think, some recent developments um, that I've been thinking about um, recently. And then um, I want to just uh, talk a, a, a little bit about my sort of opinions or hopes or dreams for the future of the discussions of values in science. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm interested again to hear what you think about all of these things. Um, one thing that I think is is uh, a, a new hobby horse of mine is that the term values is here to stay. Um, so sorry, Dan. Sorry, Helen. I think I think we, we, I mean you could just say there's an institutional inertia argument here, right? We've been talking about values in science since the early 20th century, um, uh, and insofar as we're kind of talking about the same stuff, we're going to keep using the same label. But I think, you know, I think what we're, when we're talking about values in science, broadly construed, we're interested in how a host of uh, evaluative things, right, of different kinds, play into the descriptive enterprise of science, how they interact with the descriptive enterprise of science. And I don't think we have another word for that that is general enough besides values, right? I think we, you know, the, the temptation uh, to get away from the term values either lets in stuff that isn't properly evaluative, so takes us into concepts like social factors or um, some people love or, or used to love um, Neuros concept of auxiliary motives, but these are not evaluative concepts. These are descriptive sociological or psychological concepts. They don't do the right work. 
Um, and the other thing is, you know, the other move I think is to narrow to some more specific evaluative concept that doesn't capture everything we want to talk about, right? So, you know, if we, um, uh, I was going to pick on the Ames approach, but maybe I'll pick on Helen just a little bit. But <laughs> if we, if we, if we, if we want to narrow our focus just to Ames or outcomes, right? We lose the important influence that a whole host of other kinds of values must play in guiding or restricting the action of science, right? So there, there's, in my book, I call them side constraints are as important, if not more important, a role for values in science as, as what we might call aims. Right? Um, and so I think that I think they're you know more narrow concepts, but they don't quite do the right work. However, we definitely need better articulations of what values are, right? If we're going to do better versions of this work. And some of the critiques, I think Helen made a number of really on point critiques of the way that values are used in the literature in some cases. Um, and obviously, that it has been a hobby horse of mine in the past to criticize the way that philosophers of science talk about values. Um, and I think there's a lot of a lot more work to be done. Um, you know, it, it can be scary work. We might have to talk to meta ethicists at some point. I know we don't want to do that, but it might have to happen. Um, but we need to we need to go somewhere to find a better articulation for the concept of values and maybe, you know, a, a kind of um, sort of categorization of types of values, maybe it's helpful. Um, another thing that I struggled with, whether I was gonna make it a, a recent trend or a future trend um, is what I wanna call the institutional turn, right? So again, this is not something that is totally unheard of. Um, we could look at some of the work of Torsten Wilholt, for example, um, talking about institutions. Heather Douglas has recently turned her focus to institutions. Um, if we understand the concept of institution broadly, right? Organizations are a kind of institution. Um, I think there's a lot of um, there's a, there's a lot of work to be done um, in thinking about um, <laughs> Not just the role that institutions play in the picture, but how how our understanding, our sort of normative understanding of values in science, um, can help us uh, contribute to institutional design, right? Institutional develop or institutional evaluation and design. I think there's a lot of important work to be done there, and I think in order to do that work, right, there, the the discussion of values in science needs to become an increasingly cross disciplinary or interdisciplinary. Or multidisciplinary conversation, right? It's already a pretty multidisciplinary conversation, right? I mean, within philosophy, philosophers of science talk to bioethicists. Um, you know, we also talk to historians, sociologists, um, scientists, policy people. Um, but I think you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of people who have stakes in this conversation, right? Um, uh, Within different fields of philosophy that we're not used to talking about, talking to maybe metaethicists, political philosophers. Um, I think philosophers of language uh, have an important role to play here. Um, insofar as language is the currency of science in some sense, um, and uh, and with that, you know, outside of philosophy, I think drawing in to the discussion not just historians and sociologists of science who we're used to talking to. Um, science comm scholars, um, literary and cultural studies, people who are looking at the way that science is represented in art and popular culture. Um, there's a variety of cross-disciplinary conversations that need to happen, and I, my hope is that that, can, that becomes more and more um, broad. Um, and then another thing which I, I struggle exactly how I want to conceptualize this, um, um, and again, I'd be grateful for your ideas, but I think um, uh, one of the things, um, I'm, I'm interested in what you think about this, Carlos, I think one of the things that we need to think about is the role and responsibility of science and scientists in, uh, in a condition that we think are facing of, of real crisis, right? Um, we, you know, we can think about hopefully temporary crises like the, the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. What was the responsibility of scientists? Did they fulfill those responsibilities? It's an interesting question. 
Um, but I think with the climate emergency, you know, bearing down on us more and more, um, you know, what what the role of science uh, is and ought to be um, when this goes from being a problem, right? When this goes from being a wicked environmental problem to an impending crisis to a long-term emergency situation, and does that change the way we think about the nature of science and the role of science in politics and democracy um, uh, is something I want to think about. I also want to think about, um, you know, how should science react to the possibility of science itself being under existential threat, right? Um, there's a kind of like, uh, there's a kind of um, alarmist version of this that we've been talking about since at least like the George W. Bush administration, like science is gonna come to an end because they are making some small regulations or taking away a few billion dollars, right? But I think there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's another version of this worry, which is, um, you know, I think it's conceivable that if things go certain wrong ways in terms of environment, politics, et cetera, the conditions that make it possible to do science, as we now think about it, may go away. Right? Um, and what is the role of science in facing that kind of existential threat to itself? What is the role of philosophy of science in thinking about um, that kind of existential threat to science? That's one of the kind of future, you know, it's a, it's a, I guess it's a dream for the future that we might actually have something valuable to say about that kind of question. Um, all right, that's my, that's my ideas about the past, present, and future values in science. Um, I'd like to do what you think.